podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp, as always, you know who's here. Thank you for tuning in. This week on the show, we're covering a topic that, I'm just going to be honest, it it must be a favorite of everybody listening. Like every time we cover it, it gets a lot of downloads. People love this stuff. Maybe it's because the logo on our show includes this. We're talking about the brain. This week, we are interviewing Rebecca Schwartzlos, and I think I pronounced that right. I've I've practiced, you know, sometimes I get these wrong, but Rebecca is amazing. She's a neuroscientist at Washington University in St. Louis. Many accolades throughout her career. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from MIT, and she wrote a book that actually goes on sale in a couple days, June 15th. You can pre-order it now. The book is called Brainscapes, The Warped Wondrous Maps Written in Your Brain and how they guide you. What's so cool about this episode in the book is it's really the first I've ever heard about the fact that our brain actually is comprised of many maps. So we'll go into it in the interview, but it just reiterates the idea that we are a submarine and our instruments, our senses, are the way we experience the world. And many times those instruments are interpreted in our brain, but in very curious ways. Additionally, a big part of this is I wanted to say, not only is this interesting, but how do we apply it to make our lives better? How do we use this knowledge? And we talk about that specifically at the end. So be sure to stay. One thing I want to mention, look, we've been doing this for 10 years. Most of you know this, but if you're not right now, just go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you're in Apple podcasts or whatever it is and subscribe And here's why. Not only is this episode amazing, but we really have some good ones coming up. I just want to tell you, I had the chance to interview the strength and conditioning coach, but also the mental coach for Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and many more. So imagine this. I got to talk to the guy who helped make the goats, the goats. And that's just one example. We have another episode coming up that talks kind of about the brain. And I just don't want you to miss out. So be sure to actually hit that subscribe button. It also helps us. We're trying to reach more people. You know how this works. You listen to plenty of podcasts. Anyways, that's all I got for you. Let's keep it short. Here it is, our episode with Rebecca Schwartzlos as we talk about her new book, Brainscapes, the warped, wondrous maps written in your brain and how they guide you. Enjoy. So look, you're definitely a smart people. That's what this is all about. Um, I've got your bio here, neuroscientist at Washington University, number of accolades, awards. And then I want to talk about this discovery of a new brain region. And of course, a little bit of a PhD in neuroscience from MIT and things like that. I mean, really one of those educational careers that many strive for. Did you always strive for academic achievement, knowing that that was a passion of yours, just learning and pursuing? Yeah, I mean, I've always been very studious. I've always liked to, because I've just been curious. You know, I uh, once when I was, I think in fifth grade, I had like a experience seeing some lemurs at a at a museum, and I dove into studying lemurs for two weeks, and it was <laughs> like at the library every day. So I, I sort of have, <laughs> I just need to know, and I I'm just I love to dive in and understand. So. Um, I don't know that I I knew that was what I was going to do, but I kind of had two things I was passionate about as a kid um, that have come together in my current career, which is um, one is that I've always loved reading and writing, Mm. Um, you know, but I love to create with words and I love to kind of imbibe words. And so for me, it was um, that's always been a passion. And then also I've always been very fascinated by the mind, Hmm. Um, you know, and very kind of, you know, oddly as a kid, sort of thinking about how my own mind worked and noticing how others' minds worked. And so when I kind of went to college and had the opportunity to formally study psychology and neuroscience, it was 
it was a revelation. It was so exciting to get to see and realize that this is, um, you know, a whole field of study that that is just unending opportunities to explore and discover. Yeah, I feel like it is one of those last frontiers. And I'd imagine we've been saying that for a long time as it relates to the human experience, right? It's like, no, no, this is it. And then we'll know everything. And then, of course, there's more to go. But I feel like the brain, its complexity, every day we're learning something new. It's one of the the ones that you still feel like you could make a dent, figure something new out and make progress. Does it feel like that from your end of the table? Well, it definitely feels like there is a lot we have yet to learn about the brain. And, and in fact, I think this is true for pretty much every field is that once you become an expert, you discover how much remains unknown, mm. right? And the more you learn, the more you know that there's more to know. And I think that's true, you know, in, in plant biology and certainly in astrophysics and in many other fields, just as it is in the brain. I think the brain gets more attention and yeah. the brain is a very, very complex organ, but, you know, so is the human heart. As you mentioned that, what we don't know about the brain, what surprised you or surprises you at the current moment, being an insider, that we don't know? What's some things that are kind of surprising, like, wow, we seriously have no idea how this works as it relates to the brain? You know, I don't know. That's hard to say. There's a lot of things that we know a little bit about. Mm. So I think that we've done really good inroads in being able to say, I know a little bit about something, even like the really tricky things like consciousness. We have some kind of come glimmers of, of, of really um, interesting kind of details or, or, or clues, but we definitely don't even have them fully figured out. And I guess I would kind of even go backwards and say, you know, most things we don't have fully figured out. And in mm. fact, even the things that we have the best figured out, like things that I write about in the book, like um, like kind of visual perception, which is one of the most heavily studied areas of neuroscience and psychology, we still have, you know, mysteries to unearth. So I think that, you know, it, it's sort of along the way, we're all like in all of these different facets, we're somewhere along this path. And in some cases, we're further than others. And it kind of brings me to, your book. So the brand new book, Brainscapes, the warped, wondrous maps written in your brain and how they guide you. Now, I have to say, either you or your publisher did a great job because I love the title. I was like, Brainscapes, maps, like I need to know what it is. And that's what I want to spend our time on. I want to spend our time understanding it. What does it mean? What do you talk about? And really, what can we use this information for? Like, how I'm always really focused on how do I take your knowledge, suck it all up in like an hour and then use it to make my life better. Let's start here. Tell us, like, what is, in your mind, what does it mean? What's a brainscape? What is the general thesis behind your book? So I think in its core, um, what, the, what Brainscapes is doing is introducing people to the idea of how neural representation works. And it does that most specifically through the context of these literal maps that are in your brain. And so what I mean by that is we, we talk a lot about how different parts of the brain sort of have what we call functional specialization. So it's not that they just it just does one thing. It, can, it does kind of multiple things, but it's sort of specialized in processing different kind of kind of stimuli, doing different computations. And so, for example, when I talked about the fusiform face area, because of the connections that it has with the rest of the brain, um, and because of sort of our history, our learned experience seeing faces, it develops this kind of specificity that it's that it's processing faces and not other sorts of things in the same to the same degree. And so we've spent the last century plus kind of trying to understand what the general properties of these different areas are. And so we kind of now have this inventory that continues to grow and continues to be refined. But what we've also done is when you take one of those regions and you look within it, you find that it's it's organized. It's not, it's not just like a blob. Often there's like a, there's an organization to it. And that organization is in some cases, literally a map of what that thing is processing. And so to give you an example, um, your, your primary visual cortex is a, is a crucial part of your brain for processing information that comes in through your eyes. Um, and it's at the very back of your brain, interestingly enough, like uh, you have to like information has to go all the way back from your eyeballs, goes to hmm. the very back of your brain and then split between the two hemispheres at the back. 
there is um, a map and that map is actually representing your visual field. So that if I, if I zap a part of that brain, you're gonna see a light in a certain part of your visual field, say like straight ahead, you know, like right where your eyes are pointing. And if I zap another part to the right, you know, I'm gonna know that it's gonna systematically shift where you're gonna see that light because this is actually like, it's a flipped map. So sure. it's actually upside down and right and left. But right. you can like, you the correspondence between the space literally in your brain, on the surface of your brain, and what is being, it's representing in your visual field, be, meaning like the area relative to your, what you're looking, um, that is preserved. And it's, it's a remarkable thing because you can actually make it visible. Like, um, you know, there have been situated, like with MR, fMRI, we can, we can see this map and we can see how activity in the brain, the firing of neurons and, and therefore its effect on blood flow is um, mirroring the actual thing that you see. And, you know, in animal work, it's, you can actually like stain the cells of the brain and reveal that map quite literally so that you can see it with the naked eye. Okay, wait, I, this is okay. I think I got it, right? <laughs> okay. This is my specialty. It's like, take what really smart people say and see if I can put it in my not so smart language. So essentially... When you say a map, it, it could be an actual depiction. Like there is a constrained uh, area that represents our actual experience of the world. So if you say, okay, Chris, you can see, what can I see? 180 degrees, we'll say, right? And that's my visual field. And we put it into like a rectangle. You could then take that rectangle. It's actually on the brain. Like it's a space on the brain. And then you can say this represents the top left of what you see. So if I like look up to the ceiling, this looks is the bottom right, which is the floor. So far, so good? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say it might help to, to, to fully bring that alive to say that, you know, this, this area was first fully mapped out because of gunshot wounds to the back of the head. And in fact, you can kind of people figured out this map because if you have a gun, a, 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 a bullet that goes through a part of this map, you will become blind in just that wow. part of the visual field. So you actually can like, things can carve out a part of your visual field in a predictable way. Got it. Um, yeah. And, and I think the key to understanding it, cause it's, it's really, is just the idea that, um, is that idea of representation that like you have a cell in your brain mm -hmm. and because of how it's wired up to things that are wired up to things that are wired up to your retina, when this, this cell will fire only when something specific happens at this part of your eye. Got but it. the neat thing about representation is that not only do you have this very cool map, um, but it, it, you now can use that to process this information, even though you're not, you know, you're no longer have the eyeball, you know, and you can process things that happen on your skin in your brain. And that representation will allow you to both process them. And it allows our technologies to interfere with them. Mm. So, like modern technologies now can kind of zap or um, listen in on these brain maps and see, for example, what's happening on your skin or what you're seeing in front of your face. They can get hints of that from your brain. Without the actual sensing mechanism like the eyeball or something right so with that right exactly huh. so like okay that's creepy okay <laughs> i mean i don't know if i'm a fan of this yet but okay <laughs> no so i want to ask you this what is the approximate size of something like that do we know like is there an actual size are we talking a quarter a dime a pinhead you know what is it for that one yeah for the for primary visual cortex yeah yeah that's a good question so um it's kind of like roughly i i'm gonna guess it's like from from mapping it onto my brain, I think yeah. it'd be about the size of a playing card. Okay. Um, yeah. In terms of like how big it, it comes out to be, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's not exactly two dimensional. It's actually got a depth, and that's important too. But huh. um, in for the case versus the purposes of the book, we can really talk about it like two dimensional, and it's split between the two hemispheres. Um, and that's just actually about a third of your brain is like very deeply involved in in visual processing and other stuff. Like right. visual areas are not purely visual we think of them as visual areas. They tend to be very heavily influenced by vision. And we as, as primates are highly visual creatures. So, sure. you know, if, if we have intact vision, we tend to rely on that by far as our primary mode of gathering information about our environment. From my understanding, and you've mentioned it, is the brain isn't just 
simply segmented, right? It's not like this is vision, this is that. So let's go back to your example of you could stimulate one part and I'd see a, a light. Do we know not only would you see a light, but you would also feel this in your toe, taste this in your mouth, and therefore this piece does these three things? Are we at that level where we know kind of the, not only is this the visual portion, but it also has an impact on these downstream effects? Well, so it depends. Um, so there are some maps, uh, like the visual map that I'm describing to you, that are considered, they're te- generally called unimodal. And yet, because essentially information echoes in the brain and the whole brain is multimodal, we can use information about um, uh, from other senses and it can like feed back onto that visual area and that can like influence how how it's responding, you know, so that like, if I'm talking to you and I see your lips moving and I hear a sound, there's like essentially some crosstalk so that like Uh I can use the information um, from your lip movement to help me understand what I'm hearing and vice versa. And that can actually generate kind of feedback to these areas, even though they're really more specialized. Uh, But there definitely are more multimodal areas. For example, um, there are other areas that are more specialized for sort of types of objects. And although they have kind of been characterized generally as being visual in nature, they are they are not. They exist in the brains of blind people. So blind people also have pretty much this a very similar kind of topography in the of um of specialized areas, but theirs respond to sounds. And if you're if you're if you're seeing if you are a seeing person, your areas will also respond to sounds to some degree. So like the sound of a voice can can still give you a, like a boost in the in the FFA, or you can have um, if you hear a sound associated with a tool, it will kind of ramp up activity in a part of the brain that generally responds to manual kind of handheld tools. Mm. Um, so there's like this multimodality there as well for sure. And now a quick break to hear from one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Fundrise. In 2021, a truly diversified portfolio needs more than the traditional mix of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It needs private real estate. Studies have shown that portfolios with an allocation to private real estate generally delivered a better risk-adjusted return with more annual income and lower volatility over the past two decades thanks to its track record of consistent performance through multiple market cycles. With Fundrise, this level of powerful diversification is now available to you. Fundrise provides access to diversified portfolios of private real estate to all investors with their industry-leading, easy-to-use platform. Whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends or prefer long-term growth through appreciation, Fundrise makes investing in private real estate as easy as investing in stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of their real estate projects. And with their easy-to-use website, you can track your portfolio's performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via dynamic asset updates. See for yourself how 150,000 investors have built a better portfolio with private real estate. It takes just a few minutes to get started. Go to fundrise.com slash smart today. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash smart. One last time, head over to fundrise.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. I You mentioned something about the blood flow, and I don't necessarily want to go into something that people could just Google, which is how does an fMRI work? But are there multiple ways of understanding how the brain is functioning? So is it both blood flow and electrical signals? And do the two combined represent something specific? Or how does that work? That's a wonderful question. And I think it gets to the heart of why so often you hear very different. It's can be very confusing to follow the popular literature on the brain because, you know, one thing says, you know, it's all about molecules and one thing says it's all about frequencies and oscillations and one says it's all about networks and, you know, and, and it can say, how can it be all those things? And, um, and in fact, it, it, it is all of those things. It's a very complicated system and it can't be, it operates by, you know, it operates chemically and electrically 
it operates structurally, the connections between the neurons um, are so important. And then those things all give rise to the sort of large to topographies that I'm describing in the book. So they're all kind of intertwined. Um, in terms of blood flow in particular, we don't we don't have any evidence that blood flow, so what blood flow is doing, um, so far as we know, is more supporting neural activity rather than generating it. So okay. the actual that electrical activity is the signal itself. And if you want to get the best signal from a brain, you, you want to, rather than doing an fMRI and looking at the blood flow that tends to sort of sluggishly follow where the neural activity has happened, um, you would put an electrode into the actual brain and you could you could actually record that neural activity itself. But okay. because we like to do, you know, when possible, not put electrodes into our <laughs> participants' brains, it is, uh, it's really a handy feature to be able to have. But people who do neuroimaging, who do fMRI, ha do have to keep in mind that what we're really measuring is, it's like a shadow of the neural activity. It follows mm -hmm. it um, and it happens in the general vicinity, but it's not exactly the same thing. Yeah, because I was wondering that. I was thinking, wow, if blood flow is an indicator, man, that blood must be on point, like traveling fast, ready to go, you know, all that. But it makes sense. Do we know, this is random, but do we know the purpose it serves? Like, does it come in and clean up, right? Maybe there's damage left from the electric signal. Or does it uh, replenish its, I don't know, glucose so it has energy to fire again or uh, do we know what it does? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's it, it, so I think the primary thing. So I don't know fully the all the cellular things. It does, sure. But we think of it as bringing oxygen to the cells. That there's okay. they're very metabolically active when mm. they're firing, and essentially just like we when we're running need oxygen, um, our cells when they're firing need more oxygen. So if you if you look at the hemodynamic response, that's what we call that kind of blood flow that comes in when you part of your brain gets active. You see a little dip, which we kind of think could could reflect sort of the, that initial use of oxygen. Hmm. So it's like the use of oxygen in that existing blood. And then sort of like you get this overshoot where all this other blood kind of rushes in to help out and brings more fresh oxygen. Hmm. So we use that signal. But um, but there's obviously very complicated um, kind of functions happening under the surface that yeah. we don't see. You know, th I'm sure... I'm fully aware that just because you study the brain, you don't know every part of the brain and everything that's going on. But I just, this is more for the listeners. I heard something the other day because I think too often the brain is compared to a computer, right? And I heard this thing the other day that was talking about how it was about AI and it was about how we may never get to like fully autonomous AI with consciousness and all this. And the reasoning was we used to think when we map our entire brain, every neuron, everything in there, then, and we think of it like a computer, it's binary. So if that neuron's off, it's a zero. If it's on, it's a one. And then if based off that premise, you could essentially create a brain computer. But this is one example, and I just didn't know if, if you knew anything about this. I was reading how, you know, neurons can fire at different strengths. So like it could turn on, but only fire at 20%, which changes everything thereafter. And that's when they were like, we may never be able to do this because computers can't do that. There's no, there's no, um, you know, sort of go from a zero to a one. The binary nature makes it almost opposite of what the brain is. And like, that was just the other week. And that just blew my mind. It just, it changed the game for me. I don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? Have you ever heard this? Yeah. So I, I think you're, I know you're talking about with kind of, um, kind of postsynaptic potentials and you can have these potentials that are not a full kind of all or nothing firing. And of course, you know, the truth is that there are so many sort of graded interactions with the brain, especially with with neuromodulators like um, um, these are neurotransmitters that don't make a make a cell fire or not fire, but rather change when and how and to what degree they fire. Wow. And so we you know, when you look at a molecular level, the complexity is extreme. And I think I think what there's an awareness that it's, that in many cases, the computer metaphor for the brain has can only take us so far. Yeah. It's very, it's very useful. It's been very fruitful since the 1970s, really. I mean, it's been, it's been decades of, you know, and it helps us to think. And I use the lingo too, you know, computations, the neurons do. And, you know, the truth is it's, it, you know, it's such a complex system that in some ways we, we have to use metaphors to try to kind of get inroads into what it's doing. 
Um, but we also want to be aware that those are metaphors and they can only take us so far. So in the case of um, the brain, you could also think of it as like, you know, it's like a weather system might be a better, a better analogy for it, right? Like a mm -hmm. very complex dynamic system in which there are many moving parts and they don't just like happen in discrete pieces like a like an algorithm for a computer um, they happen in a way that sort of kind of dynamically unfolds over time and that and that that is part of why it can be so challenging to to model it yeah um, you know just like we still can't get perfect weather forecasts <laughs> for <laughs> not even close <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, because it's so complicated and because the sometimes a little difference can wind up making a big difference and, hmm. you know, so modeling that is so hard and and the kind of properties of the system emerge from all of the little tiny pieces interacting together. Yeah, it's just like you said, the complexity but it always reminds me of nobody will remember this reference, but there's a scene in uh The First Men in Black where at the end, they step out of a locker and they realize like their world is just a small piece of a much larger world. And I feel like the more we learn, it's like, oh, we feel like we've gotten to the smallest level of an atom or whatever. And then you dig in, you're like, nope, there's a whole nother world inside. I know that's what's going to happen with the brain. And it's to your point, we use analogies along the way. I was reading about how we just use the analogy of the time. So like now it's a computer. Before that, it was probably like a steam engine or something, you know, before that. So we, because the complexity is almost something we can't understand, we have to make it something we can. It's crazy. And that's your world. Yeah. <laughs> and it, well, actually, there's an interesting history of us using our technology to understand the brain. So uh, like the Greeks, you know, their big technology was aqueducts, like bringing water to places that didn't have water. And so they thought of the brain as like a series of tubes that carried this invisible fluid to different parts of the of the brain. And, and, and that process of like sh shuttling it around was what created perception and consciousness, um, mm -hmm. you know, and and so it, like, you know, even back then we were trying to understand using what was kind of the modern. And now we we you know, we have technology to understand networks. And we do see that, you know, we have the computing power to describe something as complex as the networks within the brain. Yeah. Um, and so we harness some of those network analogies as well, which are, again, really fruitful and part of the story, but of course, not the whole story. Well, I want to get back to now um, these brainscapes, because now that we understand this idea generally of the maps and how they actually um, represent something else, what are some other ones that you found interesting for the average person, just as it relates to how it impacts us on a daily basis, understanding the, the bodies in which we inhabit. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, so I actually kind of intentionally stuck to some of the, the, the more classics that were more studied. I did talk about some of the, um, uh, because I wanted to sort of explore their richness. And I think each one of them, um, and some of them people may be familiar with uh, on a kind of superficial level from a psychology class they took, um, you know, in, in uh, high school, so or or college. So um, uh, the, the 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 primary somatosensory cortex, which runs runs along here and helps us kind of uh, represent touch on our body, um, the motor cortex, which um, kind of represents different sorts of movements that we make and sends motor commands onto our muscles to initiate action. Um, the auditory cortex. I talk about like all of the different senses. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are these spatial maps, which are kind of really neat. And, you know, uh, they help us kind of represent the area of space around our bodies. Um, and sometimes, and in, in some cases, they even help us like to initiate action by kind of combining, for example, like maps of what what's happening visually with maps of um, like, maps of what's what's happening or what we see around visually and maps of what we're feeling on our face for example or like there's one for the feet so things that happen visually in the lower part of your visual field um and they're kind of aligned with with sensation on your on your lower body oh. so these 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 ways that the maps are combined to sort of automatically help you react to things um, and sort of um, very quickly without having to do these laborious computations. And, and I kind of go through an example, like if someone threw a ball at your face, um, you know, if you, if you really have, if you think about the many different kinds of computations involved with catching it and like 
charting the information from your eyes relative to your gaze, relative to your where your head is pointing, relative to where your body is, relative to where your hand is, and then like getting it so that it's in the position to catch the ball, you you know, you would have some serious face damage at that point <laughs> because it would be way too late. Yeah. So um so these maps make that effortless. They align these different kind of coordinate systems of your body and your senses in a way that allows you to almost, you know, very rapidly, instant, almost instantaneously make those kind of associations and translate from one coordinate system to the other. And now a quick break for one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by Felix Gray, the blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized our eyes weren't meant to look at screens all day and designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. Now more than ever, Americans are spending more time on computers, phones, tablets, gaming devices, and so many other sources of blue light. Felix Gray glasses are not like other blue light lenses. Felix Gray lenses filter 15 times more blue light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. Felix Gray offer classic frame styles made from acetate and hand finished for a durable, lightweight, and really comfortable pair of glasses. Non-prescription and prescription available. Check them out now, felixgrayglasses.com slash smart. If you can feel your screen time, or if you're not sure if blue light glasses are right for you, start with the best in blue light. Try Felix Gray. With their 30-day money-back guarantee, there's nothing to lose but eye strain. Listen, you've been there, I've been there, staring at either my laptop for too long or my cell phone, when you start getting sore, tired, or itchy, watery eyes, or maybe you start getting a headache. If you've experienced any of that, you need to check out Felix Gray. Get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hardworking eyes. You have nothing to lose except maybe eye strain. Go to felixgrayglasses.com smart for the best blue light glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash smart. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. FelixGrayGlasses.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. I think this, I think this is the thing. Okay. I think we just got there. So the maps of, let's call it our senses in general, it could be a lot of things, the way we move, whatever, overlap in a way that, to your point, makes it so they can, they can, synergize more efficiently and and quickly. So essentially it's like, look, we have to represent the external world in the internal world. I'm simplifying, but like we have to represent the world that this being lives in with the way it's um, figured out inside the brain. And if we put it all over the place, then it, it's, it, we're making, we're adding complexity, which allows this being uh, or which doesn't allow this being to move so effortlessly, to experience effortlessly. So by finding the connection points and then mapping those connection points almost on top of each other, it allows it to be almost uh, seamless as opposed to make them all separate. And then you have to have a communication system between all the different maps. Is that fair? Kind of. So, okay. um, so yeah, so there are some maps like I'm describing that are getting information fed to them from multiple different modalities and they are able to like, so that ne a specific neuron will fire or not fire or fire, you know, to different rates based on those two inputs from different, you know, different areas. Um, but, you know, actually to the kind of grander point that I think you're making, which I, I love, this is like the whole topic of, of chapter two of my book is that the is that um, maps happen because of space. They happen because of the physical constraints of having a brain trying to represent a whole world and having it need to be, you need it to be small and you need it to not need too much energy. Um, uh, otherwise you starve to death. Um, and so how do we kind of eke the most out of what is actually a very finite amount of tissue, right? Wow. Um, and brain, brain maps and these kind of organizational principles um, are this amazing way of getting more out of less. 
This is blowing my mind because, so I played my favorite sport ever since I was a kid is baseball. I still play baseball. I play softball, things like that. And I actually think about this relatively often. I'll be playing and I'll do something based out of habit. And it's, it's, it's hard when you think of it in, in this capacity, right? I'm running full speed. So as I'm running, like my eyes are bouncing up and down. So my whole visual field is changing and the speeds are changing and there's spin on the ball. And sometimes it's knuckling and all these things. And at the last second you do something and like you catch it to your point. And the amount of calculations, if you were to calculate it mathematically, right, are astounding. But the way the body can do it in a way that seems like it was meant to do it, which it was, just goes to your point of like the thought, and I'm using that metaphorically, that went into creating it so we could live in this world and do the things necessary for survival and and for um, success in this world. Wouldn't work in a different world because different maps would be needed. Is that fair? That is totally fair. So that, cool. I mean, I think that our brain both kind of structurally through genetics and like an evolution has been shaped to be conducive to representing information in our world. But I also talk about how very important experiences and especially early life experience in deciding how exactly these, so that once, you know, all those structural, the, you know, the structural bases for the maps and the kind of brain structure itself is laid out which is very early. I mean, you know, it's really like, it's totally, you know, it's there by third trimester of, of you know, in a fetus. Wow. And then, and then they, you know, they come out and they are exposed to this big wide world. And um, what they're exposed to um, can totally rearrange those maps. Um, and I give the example of these, these baby rats that are born in um, their, uh, they, like they were raised in a, a spinning gondola. So that instead of having like, normal gravitational force pulling them down they had double that so they're like being you know like imagine they were living on saturn or jupiter or something a, a much larger planet and they're getting pulled down with at a force that no creatures on earth have ever been pulled down naturally sure. right so that so if you look in these in the brains of these these rats that are raised that way very early in life you see that it's changed the their touch cort the the primary touch cortex the primary somatosensory cortex it's called the layout of it is changed and they have so that like if you look at their paw region so the map part of the map is the paws um, the pressure down has actually like changed it so that they are less sensitive to touch they have smaller representations for the bottoms of their feet. And they have more representations for the pressure on their nails. So like the actual map gets reworked based on their early, very early experience. Whoa. And it's giving them like, it's cluing them into what is they, their brain is essentially like automatically guessing is the most important information in that environment. That's what I was, that's what I was thinking, right? Is, and I know this sounds obvious in retrospect, but in reality, if you think about what you're talking about, you were saying it's pretty much formed by third trimester. So before any, before you actually experience anything in the world, it's formed. But what's formed is the, the basis for how the body works. What's not formed is the specifics on how it needs to work in your given environment. And again, this has been studied in, you know, kids who grow up in traumatic uh, circumstances, how that impacts their personality and their survival. But when you think about it from like a, a a brain perspective, right, that's the hardware. It's it's almost as if you bought a computer, right? And then when you bring it home, it's like, oh, you live in Antarctica. It's really cold. So my fan is going to turn slower and I'm going to actually have a heater and like just it just can adapt on the fly. That's kind of insane. It really is. And, and you know, t to be fair to the rest of our anatomy, our whole body is like that. That's true. I mean, yeah. that's, that's why your bones are stronger when you're, you know, you're active and you're, they're experiencing strain. That's why, you know, you gain weight. Your body is learning from the experiences that you have and it's changing its sort of settings in order to, you know, in what, in an automated way, is supposedly, you know, hopefully adaptive. It's not that anyone is telling your body to do that, but 
you know, the way that it sort of is set up, it's like, you know, if we go this way, you know, you push it into sort of this mode. And if you go this way, you push into this mode. Yeah. Um, and so it's just brilliant. The you know? adaptability has always, has always really impressed me. I was just talking to a friend the other day and he was like, Hey, how was the pandemic, you know, being at home for all that time for you? And I just jokingly responded. I was like, oh, I was fine. I'm a chameleon. And he was like, that's a good way to be in the world, you know? And I was thinking about it with all the stuff we deal with. I think we underestimate our ability to adapt. I really do. I think we view things like fear or uh, extreme emotions as not adapting, right? Not willing to adapt. But when you realize the, just our ability to survive various things or experiences, or um, like you said, you know, environments, and, and as they change, um, to your point, it's at the like molecular level it's in every part of our body. And this is just the brain one is not as apparent or not as well discussed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we think of our brain learning, but our whole body's learning right. and everything around us in nature is learning. I mean, trees learn from wind that pushes at them in one direction over and over again that, you know, and gravity shapes how they grow. So like there's just our nature itself is is incredibly dynamic in a way that I think we don't see and appreciate. Yeah. So tell me, how do you use this information about maps? And I know, how do I use it? That's kind of an odd word, but the general person, right? You write a book about it and beyond it being just interesting, how do you think we can use this information to inform the way we are in the world or the decisions we make or the lessons we learn? So I think a couple things. Um, I think first of all, the biggest thing that I wanted to kind of bring across uh, well, there were a couple things. One is that I wanted to, um, I wanted to share kind of the amazement of it, right? Yeah. Because I think actually when you, when you, um, and I, and I go into, once I've described the basic maps, I talk about how things like imagination and like mental imagery and dreams and memory rely on this infrastructure, these maps to give you kind of the experiences that you have. And in that way, they shape what you dream about, you know, what you imagine, how you feel when you remember. And so, and, 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 and they kind of shape how, you know, what can you keep in your mind at any given time, like your working memory capacity and how that works. So, um, and they shape your behavior. So, you know, the fact that our visual maps are warped so that um, the area, like where we're looking, the center of gaze is drastically magnified. Um, that totally shapes our behavior. So, you know, you may not be aware of it, but you're looking around all the time. And so you're like, you know, the maps themselves and you're, when you want to touch something, when you want to feel something, you do it with your hand because that's where you have the sensitivity um, because of not just your skin, but also your brain. And so we are kind of, our actions are shaped and our thoughts and our um, kind of imagination is shaped by these maps, this infrastructure. So knowing that I think can be, kind of empowering to sort of understand um, why you do the things you do and sort of to render visible some of the things that you've always done, but you didn't even notice. And so you kind of know yourself better. Um, the other things that I think are good is if you understand this, then you will um, you will understand why, you know, what what is the potential of neurotechnologies? Um, so like how the, right now there is kind of an increasing um, uh, use of, of kind of brain computer interfaces, they're called BCIs, to, um, you know, help people who are paralyzed and potentially in the long term also kind of allow us to, syn to sync up with AI. And how that's done relies upon this whole kind of architecture of representation that the brain has. And, and now that we know how it works, people can go in and manipulate it. So I want to, I, I have a chapter where I talk about like, you know, what is and isn't possible right now. And, and people will understand why it's possible because I've explained like these maps, um, then they can make their own decisions about whether they should be concerned or like how as a society we want to, where we want to go next with this information, whether we want to start thinking about um, how we might want to, you know, regulate or constrain those, um, those technological advances to make sure that people's privacy um, is, pr is protected and that, you know, people are, um, that this is being done in an ethical fashion. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the second thing. And then, you know, I would just say the third thing is that there at the end, I talk about how there are ways in which we harness these maps to kind of like go further 
And so knowing, um, you know, knowing that we often do it through these analogies, like using our spatial maps to represent abstract, complicated things like like time and, and, and numerical um, quantity, those are um, like, that's our tools. That's how we, we learn. And by understanding that, how you're doing it, you, I think it can be you know, kind of like inspiring that you, you know, maybe things don't come easily to you, but you can find a way to harness that in, in different ways. Mm. Um, and we outsource kind of by writing and um, by, um, by, you know, using our calculators. So we have all different ways of making more with this little organ in our head. And now a quick break for one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Today, many small business owners are busier than ever. Because they are focused on managing and growing their business, they can't always spend the time they wish they could on recruiting. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has made it easier to find and hire the best candidates for free. Personally, I've made some of my best professional connections on LinkedIn. With access to the best talent and the skills that you're looking for, LinkedIn Jobs can surely help you find the candidates you need. Get started by posting your job for free to reach LinkedIn's network of 740 million professionals. Fill out targeted screening questions to get your role in front of the most qualified candidates with the experience, skills, and motivation you need. Then use simple tools to filter and prioritize the top candidates you'd like to interview. LinkedIn Jobs will help you hire the right person for your role. And your first job post is free. Just visit linkedin.com slash smart. Again, that's linkedin.com slash smart to post your first job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to the episode. Yeah, I love that. Something just occurred to me as you were going through all that. I'm thinking of the analogy of these maps are like the operating system of the body. And I don't know if it's perfect, but it's the way I'm thinking about it because there's multiple operating systems in the body. But meaning like that's the general structure in which it experiences and then lives in the world. Why do you, why do you think that is? Have you ever asked yourself, like, why did the body choose this map based system as opposed to something else? And it, and it didn't exclusively choose a map based system. So actually the right. brain is like a mix of maps and also um, how I just, I describe them as codes. So there are other parts of the brain that, um, that don't make maps. Um, and instead it's like kind of helter skelter, you know, one neuron here and its neighbor might be doing something to relatively different, um, representing different, different unrelated things. Whereas in a map, the neurons next to each other are representing related things mm. like two places close together in space or two frequencies close together. Um, and so, um, so that, and those codes are really great at helping us learn new things. Um, because maps are kind of like, uh, you know, they're, they're constrained, they have boundaries and they, they represent what they represent and you can tweak them with, um, with experience, but they're pretty much like they do what they do. And so I think that stability of those maps is, is like kind of like an anchor for our brains, honestly. Um, and we have these other areas that are codes that are allowing us to make like new connections and learn new environments and um, all the amazing kind of new things we do. Um, but we then pull in these kind of more stable maps that give us that anchor to experience them in a way that we, you know, we can make sense of. Yeah, it's a, I see what you're saying. Um, the stability of the map mixed with the free flowing nature of the code kind of allows us to, I don't know, live in in the complexity we do. Cause it's not, if it was all rigid or all abstract, maybe that wouldn't work as well. It's reminding me of, I'll never forget. It was, it was a quote that was passed on, but a guest we had on told me that living in your body is essentially like living in a submarine where, you know, you don't actually, this is getting deep here, but you don't actually experience the world. You experience the world through your instruments. So the eyes are like the telescope and your, uh, like, sense or feel is kind of like the, I don't know, thermometer or whatever. And what it's making me think of, this is only furthering that analogy because it's like, yes, we're using, or we're inside the submarine and we're experiencing it through our, through our senses, which are the instruments. But the way we are making sense of that experience is through these maps. Like I can almost see a person in the brain, like, okay, they have to see, we got to like pull out that map. And I know it's not that simple, 
but we have to simplify it, especially for those that don't spend our whole lives doing it to understand. I don't know, to just, like I keep saying, better understand the thing that we, the only body we've got, the only way we have of experiencing the world. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a wonderful way of thinking of it. And I think it makes a lot of sense because, you know, the, in, the our environment is so chock full of potential information. And what we as organisms who need to survive do is we need to identify and process, you know, in this very small amount of brain stuff. Um, only those things that are going to help us, that matter to us, that will help us survive. Um, and so, in fact, we do only see like a, a tiny fraction, um, experience, perceive a tiny fraction of what is happening around us at any given time. And I, I, I talk in the book about animals who even have other sense, other forms of sensation that we don't have or can hear frequencies that we can't hear or see, you know, fr- um, wavelengths of light that we can't see. So there's there's so many different ways in which we are kind of, um, be- between like our kind of our, our tools, like you said, of gathering information and the brain itself, which further capitalizes on that and like doubles down on what's most important for you and I to survive. Um, it's very much that we are like eking out exactly what we need and hopefully not wasting any brain space on stuff we don't. Right. Yeah, it's, pre- it's precious real estate up there. It's like Absolutely. New York City prior to the pandemic. Yes. Um, Two more questions. One is just in general, with all of your experience, understanding, knowledge, education regarding the brain, the mind, what like do you geek out on the most? Like what have you learned or what do you know that we might not that just fascinates you about it or that has amazed you the most? I know that's a broad, tough question. I'm just curious if anything like sticks out to you. I I'm I'm really interested in development. So I started out studying um studying adults. So, you know, the fusiform body area was was discovered in, in college students, as many things uh, in neuroscience and psychology are. Um, but actually, time that I spent as a parent, um, in addition to time that I've spent studying the brain and, and how these maps develop, kind of both of those things led me to be absolutely obsessed with the developing brain. Mm. And the, the dynamic period by what, you know, especially after birth and in the first couple of years of life, where they are like a machine, they are pulling out exactly, you know, what they need and figuring out what's in their environment. And they're using that to shape their own brains. And to some degree, that's the brain you live with for the rest of your life. I mean, you do continue to have some ability to learn, but you are really, you know, most of the time you could say we're living with the brains of like a baby, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty much what we had. And then we kind of do, we do some, you know, obviously we're, we're learning how to harness more from less and, and kind of use these analogies and to co- understand complex ideas. But I, I think that early period of development is so exciting, so crucial. And also, so it's so it makes evident how important it, uh, it is for us to support children and families, because, you know, I don't think I think we we underestimate how how difficult a time that is and how kind of crucial it is and how, you know, if we as society invest more on on giving, you know, giving families the, the resources they need to not be financially stressed, um, to help help families with um you know, like have enriched education. These are things that actually are not just the right thing to do, but they're things that help us long term because, you know, we are building brains that are going to, it's going to be easier for those kids later to learn the more complicated stuff, you know, if they've had what they need. And so, um, you know, we should make that investment. You know, we talked briefly before recording about um, how we both are parents. And I didn't realize this until I was a parent because. I don't know, until that role switched, I kind of just took for granted being the the child, not the parent type thing. And what I've realized over time is there's a lot of focus these days on the the specificity of parenting. Like, say this in an argument, um, do this little thing, and it gets overwhelming. And then when I kind of sat back, I thought about, from my perspective, and we've had some experts on and we'll have more, I think that the the very small nuances... Mm, they matter, but they're not the most important. Like kids are resilient. You know, if you say something wrong once or whatever, it's probably not. But 
on the whole, the general way we raise or, or, or do a bad job raising or a good job raising has like the most impact on a human life out of anything. Like, I truly believe that the people who grow up and really have a tough time in this society, so much of it can be attributed to their parents. On the flip side, the vast, vast, vast majority of people who succeed in their own right can also be greatly attributed to their parents. And I think because you're saying, right, you see at that early age the impact you have, the words. They'll remember it a, a year later. They'll be like, no, remember that one time? And I'm like, what? How do you do that? You know what I mean? Because th that's how they're figuring out their world. Absolutely. You know, and so I do. I mean, there's no question. Parents have this huge impact on on their children and including their children's developing brains. Um, but I, then I also think just that we as a society sort of we kind of have the buck stop there, kind of like, you know, mm. parents, you're on your own, you know, and if you're, you know, if you're struggling financially or you're having depression or you're having marital issues or whatever, that's, you know, and, <laughs> or you can't, you can't afford childcare. Um, you know, there's so much that happens to families and families are struggling through and we don't really give families resources or even just kind of, you know, how to anger management or things like that, that can be wonderful resources. There's some wonderful kind of therapies, kind of ways in which um, therapists can help adults learn how to interact with their kids in sort of more positive ways that can, can reduce um, child depression and anxiety uh, for years afterwards. Mm. And so I think, um, you know, just first of all, having more awareness of that importance of that time period and the, and not putting it all on the parents. So giving the parents some resources would be hugely helpful. Um, yeah. It's a tough job as is, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is the toughest. <laughs> it is. I'll tell you that. Uh, well, last question on this um, in Brainscapes in the book. Let's say I pick it up. Let's say I read it. Um, and you know, I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I learned some new information, all that. Uh, what do you hope people walk away with? Um, I hope they walk away looking at their lives a little differently. Um, and maybe that seems like a, a big, a big ask, but I, I, I really try to walk through kind of the miracle of perception and the miracle of communication and how even just the experience of me writing a book and you reading it and you in your brain, you know, reinstantiating the things that were in my brain when I wrote it, all of this is like a miracle. It's amazing. And having that sort of, I think, looking at the world through the fresh eyes of seeing kind of, you know, how your brain works and why um, and why you do some of the things you do can be really exhilarating. Um, and so I, I, I hope to share that with people. I think that would be my number one thing. I love it. Well, again, Rebecca, thank you so much. The book is Brainscapes, the warped, wondrous maps written in your brain and how they guide you. Uh, the book is out, uh, what is it, June 15th, I think? June 15th. So right around probably when this episode will go out. Where else are you? Where can people find you? Um, do you, you know, are you on social? Do you have a website? Where, where can we learn more about this? Yes, I, um, I, uh, I have a, a website, um, gardenofthemind.com, which uh, used to be my blog, and I sort of expanded it just to kind of um, have some information about the book and, um, and putting some, I'm gonna put some posts related to the book up as, as it's coming out and um, more information there. Uh, and also I tweet uh, a okay. little bit. I'm uh, go the mind, G-O-T-H-E-M-I-N-D. Oh, that's um, a good so, one. Yeah, yeah. So Garden of the Mind. Right. Um, so go the mind. And it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, it's exciting that now there are more ways to kind of outreach and sort of reach out to people in um, uh, science communication fashion. So I, I do love that. Um, it's really, it's great. Well, I think it's the field to be in. People love this. They eat it up. They love to learn about the brain. It's so confusing and wondrous. So again, Rebecca, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Absolutely. All right. That was Rebecca Schwartzlos, and I hope you enjoyed that interview. As a reminder, her book, Brainscapes, The Warped Wondrous Maps Written in Your Brain and How They Guide You, will be available wherever books are sold on June 15th. All right, let's jump into the quick housekeeping items. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. 
And if you'd ever like to support the show, you can head over to Patreon at patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. Or if you just want to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's all we've got this week. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got some great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode.